All right, good morning, church. Good morning. good morning. Thank you, Clark, for the music. And today is Sunday, September 11th. You see, this time I didn't have to ask Larry what is the day today. Why? Because yesterday, September 10th, was my wife's and my Francis' 39th wedding anniversary. And what I found so interesting about our 39th wedding anniversary is it's on a Saturday. We got married on a Saturday. So here it is, 39 years later, on the very same day, uh, was our anniversary. Thank you, honey, for 39 great years, and I look forward to, to many more, and I know you do too. I've, I've often said it's the greatest day of her life, wow. September 10th, 1983. Yeah. A day that she'll live in her infamy. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. happy anniversary, sweetheart. Uh, we're continuing on with my look in, in Matthew over the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And today's text, Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 24, starts with a word that says, therefore. And what have I told you about when you find the word therefore in the scripture text? It's a conclusion to what's been said earlier. And so I'm actually going to back up and read, even though I'm not centering on what, although there's some great stuff and you'll, you'll hear it or you'll read it if you follow me along. Uh, but I want to get to why there's a therefore in this text, because I think it's very important. Before I do that, let's pray together. God, we give you thanks for your grace. We thank you for your blessing. I thank you for 39 years of my wonderful wife. And of course, the two children that have come from, from our union. And, and now two grandchildren, as well as, as, as a wonderful son-in-law. Lord, I thank you for that. And I thank you for your blessing. I look forward to many more. But now we thank you for your word which we are about to read together. Lead us in what you have from it. We thank you and praise us in the name of Jesus. Amen. So let me read the therefore, and then I'll back up and read what goes into that. Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fail or fall because it had its foundation on the rock but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish person who built his house on the sand the rain came down the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowd were amazed at his teaching because he had taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. This is the reading of God's holy word may grant us understanding to it. And so I, that's the subject of my sermon today, the, what, what I just read to you. But because there's a therefore in the beginning of that, I need to go back up and read what precedes it because what precedes that plays into this conclusion. So going back to where we stopped last week. We read through chapter, I mean, verse 12 last week of chapter seven. Let's look at verse 13 and move forward. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit... You will recognize them. Recognize who? False prophets. And people are going to come and try to mislead the church. I was going to say us, but I want us all to understand. I'm talking about all of us within the church. Recognize people through their good fruit and their bad fruit. A little sidebar here. <laughs> I can think of a number of churches I have been in, both as pastor as well as, as when I used to play in some, some Christian groups and other schools, other schools, I'm sorry, other churches. Every church has, you know, that one or those two people that everybody says, oh, well, you know, this guy's a pain in the butt. And then they put a butt on there. But, you know, he, and they make up some excuse for that person's behavior. Instead of recognizing that person may be a bad tree. And maybe it's better off if you get them out of the church. 
But what about somebody who's teaching in the name of Jesus and all they're demonstrating is bad fruit? Every tree that does not bear good fruit, and by the way, Jesus will, will repeat this in the chapters to come. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. And then comes the passage, which I have said on many occasions, scares me to death. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Or we can throw in some of the things we hear in churches. Did I not serve an administrative board? Did I not sing in the choir? Was I not part of the finance team? Was I not filling a blank? Give me a blank. Give me a blank. Come on. Come on. Clean the church. Did I not clean the church? Actually, that one is... Yes, very much needed and appreciated, but yes, that's a darn good example. Give me another one. Did I not what? Come on, there's only three of you here. We can come up with some ideas. I didn't, you didn't know I was going to do this. Come on, come on, come on. Did I not? Feed the... There we go. Did I not feed the hungry? Did I not regularly collect clothing for, 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 for the needy? Did I not once a month say, hey, this is the day I'm going to go over to such and such center. If you have something for me, put it in a basket out here. I mean, we, we can fill this in with a lot of things. Lord, Lord, did I not do this in your name? Verse 23, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. There's another time in the book of Matthew where Jesus calls people evil. Like I said, that one scares me to death. Because I, I find myself wondering, right now, give it a sermon. Am I doing it because this is what God wants me to do? This is what God has led me to do? Or is this what I'm doing because I think by so doing this, I get to get into the kingdom of heaven? That's a fascinating question. To answer that, I believe I'm doing it because this is what God has called me to do. And that has been confirmed by a lot of people, even when I wanted nothing to do with the truth. God continued to seek me. Praise be to God. But it is a question. Do I do what I'm doing because I want to serve my God? Or am I doing what I do in the church because there's something in it for me and that's what I'm looking forward to? It's a fascinating question. And that brings us down to the therefore. Enter through the narrow gate, because wide is the gate that leads to destruction. We've already read that. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're a wolf. How do we know them? Look at the fruit they produce. And remember Jesus' parable here. A bad tree does not produce good fruit. You don't get fruit from thorn bushes. You simply don't. And there are these warnings. By their fruit, you will recognize them. And then not everyone that comes and says to me, Lord, Lord, why? Because some of them are a wolf in sheep's clothing. Therefore, Jesus says, because of these things. Therefore. Well, let me stop before I get into the therefore. People might say, well, then, is there a guarantee that I have that when I die, and I'm before judgment. Will the Lord say, enter into my kingdom of rest for I know you? Or will he say, depart from me because I never knew you? That's a question, isn't it? This is Jesus' answer to that. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and, and what's it say here? Puts them into We went over this recently in my Bible study, and I know what the Revised Standard that I teach from in my Bible study says. Everyone who hears these words of mine and what? Does them. Lord, do I have a guarantee that you're not going to look at me and say, depart from me, I don't know you? Well, for me, there's the answer. A, am I hearing the words of Jesus? Now today, None of us can hear the words of Jesus, can we? And why? Because he's not here. He's not here. Where is he? 
He's in the right hand of God in, in the heavenly realms. That's what the scripture text says. Now we have the Holy Spirit with us. And so if we listen intently enough, we might be able to hear that still small voice at various times in our lives. Some people say, you know, God speaks to me all the time. Other people say, I, I, I never hear God, but yet I feel his inspiration. And, and we can talk about that for a long time. But today, if we want to know the words of Jesus, how do we do that? Read the Bible. Read the Bible. This is the living word of God. It's in written form. But as we participate in it and the Holy Spirit communicates to us through it, it becomes the word of God. Now, is everything that Jesus ever said written in this book? No. no. Even John is a good example. At the end of his book, he says, I didn't write down everything that Jesus did. But these things I wrote down, I did so that you will know and believe. And by believing in his name, you will have eternal life. John says, if you read these words and you believe them, you will have eternal life. Praise be to God. But it doesn't contain everything that Jesus said. You, you know, there's one that we come to every now and then, which is, which is a fascinating one. It's in 1 Corinthians. What does Paul say? We remember the words of our Lord when he said, you know what it says? It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, if you have a red letter edition of your scripture text, you'll see that's in red letters. Well, here's what, whenever we're reading that at any given time in a Bible study, I always say, hey, where in the Gospels do you find that? People start turning pages. Or they, they start looking through their notes or whatever. You know what the answer is? It's not there. It's not there. Even though I had a guy wag his finger, I tell you the name of Jesus. I've read it. I said, yeah, you have read it. It's right here. But I tell you the name of Jesus. It's not in the Gospels. So there's an example. Paul says, let's remember the words of our Lord it is better to give than to receive, but yet that's nowhere in the four Gospels. Now, you can read every one of them tonight if you wish, and you'll see that what I'm telling you is the truth. So here's something that Paul said. I'm not saying Jesus didn't say it. I'm saying it's not written in the four Gospels. So not everything that Jesus said and taught is in the Gospels. But these things were written so that you may believe, and by believing, you will have life in his name this is a written account of the one called jesus of nazarene the messiah the savior the one who died and the one who rose again so if we want to know his words if we want to hear his words we have to read it somebody said to me the other day well scott you know your bible really well after all you're you're a pastor and you have studied it well i hope so <laughs> I'm not going to say anybody by name, but I've known some pastors who don't know the word any more than, than, than I know the Bhagavad Gita. But I got to tell you, the person who knew the scripture text better than I've ever known was a Catholic layman of Wasco, California. That dude knew his word. And I celebrated it. Why? Because what's the Catholic Church known for? Not encouraging their people to read. This guy knew the scripture text right and left. I had a Catholic woman who was, who was my insurance agent in Bakersfield for a number of years until she moved out of town. And, and uh, a wonderful woman, enjoyed talking with her. And uh, I mean, her life alone is a sermon. Uh, she, she was married, had three children, her husband left her. She asked her parents, can, can, can and I move back in with you? No, you chose to live with that scumbag. Now stay out there with him. Well, no, she divorced the guy because he was a jerk. But she has three children. What did she do? She went to Employers Training Resources. She got trained in an in insurance, what do you call it, insurance, a broker, whatever that training is. And she was borrowing money from or taking money from the county to provide her a place to live and some food for her children. When she got her insurance license, with her first check, she went right back to the state of California and she gave that money back. My hat's off to this woman. I mean, really celebrate this woman. She told me one day, she goes, Scott, you know what? She goes, you know I'm Catholic. I said, yeah, I know that. She goes, well, you know what's bothered me about Catholics? <laughs> she said, well, that's a conversation you and I can have for a long time. She says, one thing that bothers me about Catholics is that we Catholics are not urged to read the scripture text. And that is bothering me because I find that there are things in the scripture text I don't know therefore there's things in the scripture text my children don't know which means there are things children in my church that they don't know so I went to the priest the other day I said father 
Can I offer a teenage Bible study class? And he said, please do. And she said, Scott, I'm teaching the scripture text every week and it's marvelous. Not only am I not teaching, but I'm learning. How do we hear the words of God today? By reading them. And it's something any one of us can do. Something my son and I were talking about last week when we were talking about the different writings of the different religions. I've already mentioned the Bhagavad Gita. There's the teachings of the compassionate Buddha. There are the Upanishads. There, there is the Quran. There, there, there are many others. And I said, you know, Jerry, what, the one thing I like about this book, as opposed to any of the others, well, actually outside of the plan of salvation, Really, that's what separates Christianity from all other religions. When you get down, you say, let's talk about sin and salvation. There's only one that says, I do it for you. That's this one. All the others is you got to do it for yourself. And then you better hope Jesus says, I do it for you. But one thing I like about Christianity, what language do you speak? Let's give it to you in that language. This book has been translated into more languages than any other single book ever printed, not even mentioning the many different translations of this text. If you want to be a Muslim, um, outside of the five pillars of Islam, there's, you cannot become a Muslim until you can say there is one God, Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet, and you have to say it in perfect Arabic, or you don't get to join the club. Christianity doesn't do that to you. What language do you want? My son-in-law's parents, that has been their career, working as missionaries at Wycliffe Bible Institute, trying to translate the Bible into other languages so that other people can have the Word of God. Brothers and sisters, there is no excuse today for not hearing by reading the Word of God. There is no excuse today for not hearing by reading the words of our Lord. And so again, Jesus is saying here, if you don't want to miss that narrow gate, if you don't want to be misled by wolves and sheep's clothing, if you don't want to be told, I don't know you, everyone who hears these words of mine and then follows it up, it's not enough simply to hear it, but to put them into practice. Jesus says, the works I do, you will do, and even greater works than these you will do because I go to the Father. When I hear that passage from the Gospel of John, I begin to ask myself, well, what works did Jesus do? Well, the ones we've been looking at in the book of Matthew and in, in, in my Bible study, what's he say when, when John the Baptist comes along or he sends his disciples, are you the man, is there another one? What's he say? You go back, you tell your master what? The blind are, the, the dumb are, Given speech. the lame are, the, 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 uh, the, oh, there's some others I'm missing here. Uh, well, the sick are being healed. There, there are some others. Oh, oh, the lepers are being cleansed. And the freedom being proclaimed to the captives, the captives of sin. And so if I think of those things alone, the works of Jesus... Then what am I doing on those five areas alone? And then, then there's so much more. What does Jesus say in Matthew chapter 25? When you've done it to one of these, when you've done what? When you've fed the hungry, when you've clothed the naked, when, when you've given drink to the thirsty, when you've visited those that are sick and in prison, which is the reason why I'm going into Kairos again and in Folsom Prison in this October, because Jesus said, go to the prisoner and visit them. And by, by the way, even those of you who aren't going, you can help by doing what? Baking cookies, absolutely right. Thank you, Bob. Great. Right. Yes, you. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. You're absolutely right. The 24-hour prayer wheel. You can pray. The, you may not physically go in there, but through your prayers, the Spirit can be strengthened to go on in. Whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice does the words of God. It's like a wise person who built their house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. 
and it will stand because it's firm. And then Jesus gives the opposite. Before I reread that, I think what we often think is, is what Jesus is comparing here is the believer versus the unbeliever. The believer is built on a found, firm foundation and we're going to stand in the storm. The unbeliever has no foundation and therefore they're going to wash away. Please note though, as I read this, Jesus isn't talking about believers versus unbelievers. He's talking about what? People who claim to be? <laughs> what did we read in the previous part? Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons in your name? Did we not perform miracles in the name? Jesus' comparison is not believer versus unbeliever. It's believer versus believer. Let's read it. But everyone who hears these words of mine, see that? They may be doing exactly what we're attempting to do. They may be reading the scripture text every day. They may be asking for God to send the Spirit so that I can know and I can understand. I am a believer. Great, I believe. But what am I doing with it? Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice. See, there is for Jesus the dividing point. You hear my words. You believe my words. You, 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 you believe and you proclaim that I rose from the dead. Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do miracles in your name? But yet, you aren't putting my words into practice. Like I said, if I'm doing this because I think I'm getting something out of it, I'm doing it for all the wrong reasons. It's like, Feeding the hungry. You, you've done it. Tory Shelter and Salvation Army. Uh, Bob and Peg, I don't know if you guys have done this or not, but, you know, anytime you do something like that, who do you run into? On a negative side, you run into people that are, come on, let's say it, pains in the what? Neck. Yes, thank you. I'll take that. I'll take that. That's not exactly where I was going, but I'll take that. And, and uh, Jerry and I uh, in, in Bakersfield were, were doing a thing called Feed the Hungry, which was a program put on by a buddy of mine, uh, Annie, Annie Hutchings' father and mother did this for many, many years. They closed the IHOPs that they owned and operated in Bakersfield, and everybody went to one IHOP next to Bakersfield High School, downtown Chico, up to Bakersfield. And uh, the, the homeless were invited to come and have a Thanksgiving meal. And, and, and the city, the buses, would go to various different places around the area, places such as the Bakersfield Homeless Shelter, and even certain parks where the homeless hang out. And they said, you want a meal? And people would come and climb on board the bus, and they'd come over to, to, to the IHOP there next to Bakersfield High School, and they'd get out and they'd line up and they'd wait for their dinner. And it, it, was, it, was, it was turkey, it was mashed potatoes, it was gravy, it was salad, uh, all the coffee you want provided by Starbucks. I, I mean, folks, this was a wonderful, wonderful program. And when Jerry joined me one night, I said, Jerry, let me tell you what's gonna happen, buddy. You're gonna run into some people that you're gonna wanna drop kick through the goalposts of life. Because they're gonna be demanding, they're not gonna want turkey, they're gonna want a hamburger, and you're gonna tell them, look, buddy, here's the, here's the deal. You get turkey or you go out, there's somebody who wants your seat. And I said, this is gonna happen, and it did. I said, but Jerry, please, please. Try to look at the others. The others that come to you and they say thank you. And yes, some will put their arms around you. Try not to think of what's coming off of them onto you. They're happy for what you did. They're thanking you for what you did. And you tell them, you, you need to thank that couple over there. They're the ones that do all this and they'll let go of you and they'll go over and they'll thank that couple. Now, if you're at any one of these kind of events, I don't care where they are, Tory Shelter here in, 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 in Chico, uh, the, the Union Gospel Mission off of Richards Boulevard in Sacramento, the Union Mission in downtown Pasadena, these places that volunteers serve food so that people can eat. If you're doing that for any reason other than the love of God for those people, I've got to tell you, 
you're doing it for the wrong reason. When you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. So Jesus says, everyone who hears these words of mine, feed the hungry. There's one word, one phrase. And does not put them into practice, does not do them. It's like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and, blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. And what's the answer when that happens? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I do not know you. Brothers and sisters, are we hearing the words of God? And are we doing them? Are we doing them not because by so doing, I think I'm building up my treasures in heaven, but because I'm being obedient to the God who saved me. While I was yet a sinner, he died for me so that I might live. Is this why I do what I do? Is this why you do what you do? Is this why we do what we do? We hear the word and we do the word. That's the challenge. Now I could really end right there. Perhaps I should. But there's one other small paragraph at the end of this. And I read it, so I feel the need to address it. And it throws some people when they read it. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowd were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, I tell you what, that is a great question. What exactly does it mean? Well, let me tell you the words of Donald Hagner from his three-volume book on, the, on Matthew. What has Jesus been addressing earlier in the Sermon on the Mount? You have heard it said, said but I say to you, what is Jesus addressing there when he says, you have heard it said? The teachings of the? Pharisees. And, and the rabbis. You know, somebody there can tell you what Rabbi Hillel said 300 years before this day. And all of the rabbis, they have names. There's, there's whole entire writings about the teachings of the rabbis. And so when they got up and they taught, they said, well, as Rabbi Hillel says, as Rabbi Gilligan says, or whoever the, the name of the rabbi is. And so you come up and you ask a question, uh, what about... Uh, the upcoming World Series, well, as, as Rabbi Smith would say, I mean, they just simply wouldn't come out and say, this is what I think. They're always throwing out the authority, which is the rabbis before them. Jesus comes along this entire Sermon on the Mount. And he says, you have heard it said, but I say to you. In other words, he doesn't care about what the rabbis have said before him. He's a karatite, which is a rabbi. By the way, Jesus was called rabbi. Yes. Jesus himself is a rabbi. It's a rabbi who doesn't care about the writings of the other rabbis. He cares about what the scripture text says. And what they're excited about Jesus, how they're amazed at his teaching, is Jesus comes along and says, this is what I say. And they say, whoa. There's something different here. And indeed there is. Later on, as you get into Chapter 10, 11, and 12, we're going to read what we looked at last night in my Bible study when Jesus says, you know, Jonah came, Jonah prophesied, but something's greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of Sheba came from the south to visit Solomon, but there's something greater than Solomon is here. Jesus is saying, yes, I'm going to teach from my authority because it's greater. This is what is being said here in this final paragraph. He teaches as one who had authority and not of their teachers of the law. He claims his own authority. He says, this is where I stand. And in somewhat of a sad note, where did that lead him? On the cross. Brothers and sisters, I hope we're hearing the word. I hope we're in it daily. But moreover, I hope we're doing more than just hearing it. But we're doing it. We're practicing it. And then we will be on a rock in the middle of the storm. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your grace.
We thank you for the teachings of Jesus. We pray that you lead us in. Lord, we want to be on solid ground with you. And Lord, there still are some people who go, well, I don't know what God wants me to do. I always want to say, open up your eyes and look around you. There's plenty of things to do. Not to mention some of the things we were having fun with in the middle of this sermon. These are all things that are, that are wonderful. It's a blessing when people do these things in the church. And I don't want anybody to get any other message than that. But there's always something to do, especially when you think about the world outside. Something as simple as cleaning out our closets and giving the clothes away to people who can use it that way. Anybody can do that. So Lord, we want to hear your word and we want to be doers of your word so that at the end of our life, whenever that will be, we'll hear you say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Lord, lead us in your grace. Lead us in your ministry. Thank you for these things now in the name of Jesus. Go forth. God, be blessed this week. And I'll see you next week.